So it's a distinct privilege to introduce two people who have some of the most difficult jobs in the Department of Defense, both Mr. Robert Powers, the president of the Naval Discharge Review Board, and Colonel Edward C. Segura, the president of the Air Force Discharge Review Board, lead teams that have the responsibility of adjudicating hundreds, if not thousands, of discharge upgrade applications a year. The bulk of these applications are filed by veterans with less than fully honorable discharges without advocates. That leaves the board, the boards, with the task of evaluating many applications that might lack evidence or appropriate arguments for relief, which I imagine to be an extremely difficult task. I, will often, I, will, I often say that our responsibility as advocates is to help veterans submit discharge upgrade and record correction applications that are robust, thorough, and well-supported. In effect, we are trying to clearly lay out arguments for the boards of review that give them everything they might need to evaluate an application for a discharge upgrade or record correction. So we are fortunate that the Department of Defense conducts outreach and education at events like this, education and outreach that gives advocates and veterans a chance to learn more about specific boards of review, in this case, two of the discharge review boards. As an advocate, I'm extremely grateful for this power, to, this, this, for this opportunity to be educated by Colonel Segura and Mr. Powers and to engage in conversation with them as well. And with that being said, a little biography about Mr. Powers and Colonel Segura. Mr. Powers currently serves as the president for the Naval Discharge Review Board, the NDRB. Before his current employment with the NDRB, he served as the president of the Physical Evaluation Board, a judicial intern for the Honorable C. Philip Nichols Jr. and as a legislative assistant for a member of the Maryland Congressional Delegation. While in the US Marine Corps, Robert Powers served as a Force Reconnaissance Commander, Maritime Special Purpose Force Commander for 22nd MEU, and as a Light Armored Reconnaissance Officer. Mr. Powers is a graduate of the Washington College of Law, American University, cum laude, Naval Postgraduate School, and the Citadel, summa cum laude. He is a member in good standing with the Maryland and Florida State Bar. Colonel Edward C. Segura is a Reserve Advisor, Air Force Review Boards Agency, Joint Base Andrews, Maryland. He advises all agency boards on reserve matters and oversees discharge review board operations on behalf of the Secretary of the Air Force. The board examines the equity and propriety of former members' administrative discharges and considers applications to the board for upgrades to their service characterizations. Colonel Segura graduated from Louisiana State University in 1993 and was commissioned in March 1994 through officer training school. He has commanded a service flight, a services flight, aircraft maintenance squadron and mission support group. Additionally, he commanded the Air Force largest expeditionary aircraft maintenance squadron while deployed. And with that, I will turn it over to, uh, to Colonel Segura. Hi, good, good morning, I guess, uh, to, to you. And uh, we are very honored to get the opportunity to speak to this group. And, and express our gratitude in, in what you do. And because our intent, uh, our charge actually is probably the better term, uh, is to get it right. Uh, so anything that you can do uh, when advising a, a former member uh, as to how to give us a complete and using, using the words earlier, complete and thorough picture of, of the discharge and what happened really helps us out. And just to reiterate, uh, it, we're looking at equity and propriety. So, so when a case comes to the board, uh, the Air Force Discharge Review Board, it has to fit in one of those two buckets. And my last two slides, whenever we get through the, the briefing, really I'm presenting more for your future use because I, I believe that it, when you're looking at a case and whenever you're looking at uh, the contention, if you can look at those two slides and kind of see, all right, where does this fit? Where, where do we see the issue being? Uh, because obviously we as a discharge review board are not here to grant upgrades uh, and we're not here to deny upgrades. We're here to uh, find out 
did we, the United States Air Force, get it right? Uh, and, and if we did, great, we'll leave it as such. If we did not, we, we have the opportunity to correct it. So let's go through a couple of basics. And I know y'all are well versed, so I'll move quickly. Um, our composition uh, per the DOTI is five members. Something uh, that we do in the Air Force is we will have two senior NCOs, a master sergeant, senior, or a chief, sitting on each and every board that involves an enlisted member. Uh, so other than that, we'll have myself, the board president, uh, a medical representative and a JAG. As I'm sure you're aware, uh, depending on a mental health condition or, or MST, uh, military sexual trauma, we, uh, as required, will have a mental health provider as our medical provider, and they are voting members of the board. Uh, I know you've heard this, but it is essential for me that, that you, you, you fully uh, appreciate that our assumption going in is that the Air Force did it right. So, what we need is we need the applicant or you to assist the applicant in submitting substantial evidence uh, to show us where the Air Force did it wrong. And uh, in that, what we're going to look at is we're going to look at uh, the application uh, and any attachments. So if you give us 250 pages, we're going through 250 pages. Uh, we're going to go through the, the record that we have from the Air Force. Uh, and then any other evidence uh, that, that is necessary to review the case. But, but the biggest thing is going to be what, what is the applicant contending uh, and then what evidence is provided to, to substantiate that? Because as the bottom, we're not an investigative body. We, we don't have a staff to go out there and, and, and do research. So, uh, so we review what we have. A couple interesting uh, tidbits just to give you a feel for, for our, our flow. We receive over 600 applications a year. We board 350. The delta in that is we have a lot of cases that are too old, more than 15 years, and we're going to send them to the Board for Correction of Military Records, or uh, we've already seen them. So administratively, we have, we have a number that, that aren't uh, viable cases, as we call them. But the Air Force, just to give you the flavor, the, the overwhelming majority, 73%, they're asking for a general to an honorable and something else typically, but a general to an honorable. We do not get a lot of UOTHCs or bad conduct discharge requests. Uh, so if you're working with one of those, uh, it's, it's good for you to really highlight how this is, is different. Uh, and then uh, just for your uh, essay, situational awareness, sorry, uh, about 61% of our cases involve a mental health component now. So those, those are getting more and more complex. The authorities that we look at, and those are just numbers to you, but uh, they are administrative discharges. 3207 is for officers, 08 is for active duty, and 09 is for the Guard and Reserve. But we look at administrative discharges. We do not look at medical discharges. And I, I put the example up there. So for example, same case, and I use Johnny. It could be anybody. But uh, he was identified at basic military training with asthma got an entry level separation under erroneous enlistment. So if he's asking for an honorable because, hey, it wasn't in the first six months or something like that, that comes to us. We have that authority. Uh, if he's asking for a change to his reenlistment eligibility code, that comes to us. If he wants to get it changed to a medical discharge, the discharge review board as the Air Force sees it does not have that authority and that would go to the board for correction of military records. Uh, so that's what I mean by medical discharges. Um, and then um, the last uh, administrative thing that I wanted to go through, the bulk of our cases are records only. So it, it's about 90%. Initially, a lot of people will ask for a personal appearance, but then whenever we start trying to schedule it, it becomes cumbersome and they end up saying, well, let's go records only. And then if, if I don't like the results, then I'll come back and possibly ask for a... Uh, uh, a personal appearance. Uh, we do do we do have an outreach where we'll go to uh, regional locations uh, three times a year. Uh, and just for your uh, information, clemency for us is only for bad conduct discharges from a special court martial. Other than that, it's got to be the equity or impropriety. So we will grant relief proper. 
Uh, we're going to look, uh, and I'm sorry, uh, up front, we used to uh, upgrade about 8 to 9%. Now, keep in mind, most of ours get generals to begin with, uh, and now it's about 19, 20% overall due to liberal consideration, which I understand y'all are, are, are aware of. Um, as far as proper, it's got to be an error. If you see an error, tell us the error, identify it, and walk us through how the error caused a prejudicial error. That's not the bulk of what we see. We see equity, where some, someone will say it wasn't a fair case. Uh, the Air Force maybe did everything proper, but didn't consider everything or consider things they shouldn't have. Uh, and the other evidence is where you're really helpful in helping us get that complete picture. Um, I wanted to kind of walk you through the liberal consideration. You, you've seen the, the progression from 2014, 2016, 2017 memos. Uh, and those are the names of the uh, secretary or undersecretary who, who generated them. But to me, the most applicable for the Air Force Discharge Review Board whenever we're going through a case is the CURTA memo, where, where it, it lays out that liberal consideration is not an automatic upgrade. It kind of gives us a framework and some things to consider whenever we're looking at the behavior by the, mem uh, the member. And I'd like to kind of walk through a case uh, of the four questions that you see there on the slide uh, to kind of walk you through a yes or a no. Um, so the first question is, did the veteran have a condition or experience that may excuse or mitigate the discharge? Uh, let's, let's say that uh, it was uh, drug abuse and uh, the individual got kicked out for, for drug abuse. Uh, but the individual contends that it was as a result of a mental health condition, military sexual trauma, or post-traumatic stress disorder. So liberally, we say yes. They have it. They told us they have it. Got it. So A is a yes. Did the condition exist or experience during the military service? Now, that can come straight from the military member's uh, testimony. It could come from uh, doctor's uh, appointments or, or from the VA afterwards. So the first two are pretty easy to get to a yes. Next, does the condition uh, excuse or mitigate the discharge? So what we're looking at there is we're looking at, so drug abuse, is that something that would typically be tied to the condition? So were they self-medicating or anything along those lines? Uh, and in which case, in most cases, if they're claiming PTSD, a lot of the actions that they took uh, are determined to, to mitigate and are, are associated with uh, that uh, mental health condition or situation. But the final one, so, so three yeses are, are, are typically going to, going to happen. The fourth one, does it outweigh the discharge? So now what we're looking at is what was the behavior? I will tell you typically if there's violence associated, that bar is really, really high. Uh, so now, uh, which meant our, uh, marijuana that, or drugs, that may be a bad example. So let me give you an example where we would say no on that. If the individual had said, I was self-medicating, got it. It is possible, yes, we're all the way there. But then whenever we look through the whole case, if it's determined he was using drugs before he, the, the event that, that he or she contends, then you weren't self-medicating then. You, you were actually using drugs. Uh, so, so we try to look at the whole thing. So that's where you may have three yeses and still end up with a, with a no. So that's where we need you to help us paint the full picture. My next two slides, I won't really talk to because I'm trying – uh, to keep it short, if you could. These slides are what we physically look at while we are going through a case. And we try to look at, all right, if it's an impropriety, these are the words that we are looking at to try to determine, does it fit in this bucket? And next slide. Equity, this is the slide that we look at uh, to try to figure out, okay, so where, where does this contention fit? And with that, I'll, I'll hold for questions uh, till after and turn over to Mr. Powers. The first thing I do is just, I'd like to uh, let you know, this really is a personal honor, professional privilege to be here to speak really on behalf of the Assistant Secretary of the Navy, Mr. Slavonic. He very much wants to make sure that we are taking care of veterans. In many cases, veterans that are just slightly misbehaved, and that's the ones we're looking at here many times 
at the Naval Discharge Review Board. But also, I have to really let you know it's an honor because I truly believe that it's advocates like you that are really keeping this process true and in its most fit form. If you really look at how the DRBs became established and to the standards they have, you can look to the lawsuits back to the 70s that actually changed uh, how we process and look at veterans. And the fact that we have advocates and, and uh, that you're willing to better understand the process, those that are there right now and those that um, potentially view this in the future, uh, really do. I congratulate you on trying to make a difference for that. And so what I'd like to do is just talk about really not necessarily the science, but also the art. Next slide. So what this really does, it talks about the process. Interesting enough, you know, what's glaring about that is that we have sort of the same uh, statistical anomaly that the Air Force has. If you look, we receive about 4,000 cases a year. We're only processing less than half of that because of that, half of those cases rough. 33% of the stats are up on the spot. But basically, half of the cases are actually misfires, as I call them is that they really should go to BCNR because it's been greater than 15 years. So that's something that always, you know, look at the jurisdictional issues as an advocate. Hey, is this case older than 15 years? Then you go to BCNR, uh, Board of Action Naval Records. If not, then DRB. And or the case isn't completely uh, prepared, and so then we've got to return it so it can be processed. Uh, the other thing I would point out is you can see we have actually increased the number of hearings we've done in the last couple of years. And one of the things that we implemented to make sure that we're making ourselves more available to the applicants is we offer telephonic hearings. And I'll be honest with you, no good, no good deed goes unpunished. That literally has doubled our request for personal appearance hearings. Because in the past, if you wanted a personal appearance here and you had to travel to Washington Navy Yard, we don't have traveling boards. And so that's a, a big cost for the applicants. So we make it available telephonically, which just simply means is you get the same hearing, but you can call in, the advocate can call in, his attorney or her attorney can call in and we'll listen to you and have you present your case. And of course we have the documents that you've sent previously. So that's an option. And of course we've been able to do more hearings as a result. Uh, the downside is we have more people ask for more hearings, so now we have a substantial backlog of 20, 22 months of uh, personal appearance hearings. This really just points out that uh, statistically there is a difference, that uh, the memos have made a difference, liberal consideration, as you can see. Historically, we you know hovered around 8% upgrade rates. You can see that that substantially changed, especially if you have a mental health condition or and PTSD is a subset of the mental health condition, which apply in liberal consideration. And I would really just uh, point out, next slide. On this slide, the, the point here without laboring on it, look, there's two types of reviews. This is straight up administrative law document review and a personal appearance hearing review. The document review is where you submit your records. We're looking at the entire service records and we're looking at whatever evidence, statements, claims you put in and conducting a document review. And then of course the personal appearance hearing is you have the ability to show up in person and or by telephone or VT, we don't have a VTC capability for us to hear your case. Next slide. You know, there's a, out of law school, there's may have read the, the book, How to Win Your Case. You know, and the secret is you only pick the cases you know uh, that are gonna win. Well, we don't have that luxury. And many times you probably don't have that luxury. You're taking a case and you're trying to present the facts in the light most favorable. And many times as lawyers, you're trained that you're really going the propriety argument. The legal argument is the winning argument. Well, I think the, the reality is that in many ways, the true art of advocacy is, yeah, you're looking at the legal argument, but you're really hitting the emotional, psychological aspect of that. And I think that's probably, if you have one takeaway from my brief, is to be, the most important thing that you can do as an advocate 
to present your case, the most persuasive case, is when you're really talking about giving the reasoning why this Marine or Navy failed to do their duty. That's the crux of it. Because really our system, when you really look at it, is why what we do, the purpose of the NDRB, the DRBs, is we are validating if that Marine or sailor was bad enough to get kicked out. Another word for that is saying, we're making sure that there are no arbitrary and capricious commanders out there, and they erroneously denied this Marine or sailor his rights and kicked him out of the Marine Corps or Navy. So that's really what we do. We're validating our process. And so in many ways, if we have a correct process in the fleet, in the field, in, in the, uh, out there on ships and in, in the uh, woods, it's, we probably should only have a 5% error rate. Because that would, because you know, the reality is we have good and faithful commanders out there trying to make the right decisions, and sometimes we have Marines and sailors fail to do their duty and make uh, misconduct errors. Uh, that's very different than the VA, because when you look at the VA, you know, I just said is the the DRBs validate the Marine or sailors bad enough to get kicked out. That's very different than the VA. They're validating that the Marine or Sailor is good enough to get benefits. That's a very different standard to keep in mind when you're looking at these cases and why we have the uh, rates we have. Now, uh, focusing on the slide specifically is keep in mind, it's all about your audience. And so the reason I just talked about that, your audience are these previous commanders. These are these colonels and captains who had ranks of 100, ranks of 500, and they had 499 great Marines, and one decided that they were going to start dealing drugs. And so when you're telling them the system is wrong, you have the caveat on is, hey, look, look, let's look at what happened and what the decision for this individual sailor was. And so the, the key point here is you need, really would focus, I would focus first and foremost on the equity argument. And that is, why should we give Lance Corporal Banats a clemency? Why should we upgrade him? Why, could, why should he get more mercy than what he originally got? And so what you're really doing is you're going to the heartstrings of the board members. And we have, you know, we have an occasional JAG lawyer that sits as a board member, but almost everyone's a non-legal trained officer. So uh, that's very important. Finally, the other thing, the key thing would be is focus on the nexus of your case. Focus on why this connect and why the, you know, claim has a nexus. So I sort of alluded to it is, I will tell you is probably a good quick example is, you know, if you, you, you look at the case and you're like, I'll give you an example. Let's say that uh, the individual was accused of fraternization and sexual misconduct in the barracks. And then he found guilty or it was caught. And so basically they're processing that we're gonna take him to court martial, where there's a question of whether it was consensual, non-consensual, between the two individuals. So they decided to take a separation in lieu of uh, trial. They basically have a plea agreement. And then the agreement is that, hey, if you accept the silt, where you're gonna waive your administrative board in, and in exchange will only give you a uh, discharge with a general characterization, not another than honorable, just a general. And so what happens is they actually get kicked out, but they actually end up with an other than honorable administrative character or other than honorable characterization. Well, on its face, that's an impropriety. And if you walked in there and said, board members, you have no choice. You have to upgrade my client because this is a clear impropriety. I will tell you, the first thing is you never tell a judge what they can't do. You tell a judge what they can do. And so that philosophy is something you probably want to do with these board members. You explain, hey, look, this, my, my applicant client is doing right. He's uh, very productive. He has no moral turpitude, no misconduct in the civilian world. He's a great citizen. This was a wrong error. He was Im improperly, this was consensual. And oh, by the way, 
we actually had an agreement that said he was supposed to get it generally, he didn't. That's sort of a more persuasive style that I would do when presenting before this, these boards. And again, you know, to keep in mind, we're a review board, not a clemency board per se, although there's a new memo saying we, and really what that means is we're looking at, we can now look at equity. There really are two styles of cases we get. We get many cases that are straight up, the individuals did drugs and they got kicked out. And the Marine Corps and Navy have a little higher, or actually I should say have less tolerance and many of those cases end up with another anonymous. And those are tough cases. Where the landscape has changed is we have a lot of our veterans who are combat veterans. And so they've gone into theater they do have an underlying mental health condition, whether it's PTSD or TBI or, or some of the other ones. And the issue would be is, hey, their reasoning skills were impacted. And so in this, this hypothetical, you know, you've got a Marine sergeant returns from Iraq in 30 days, meets with friends out there in a bar and he smokes marijuana, allegedly just one time. And then he goes back in and he gets your analysis and he pops. It's not surprising that he ends up with gets kicked out with an OTH. And so you're like, well, how do I get an upgrade? Well, one of the things of the case is, hey, look, this guy, you look at, you need a theory on these cases. You can't just come in and say the magic words of PTSD. It does not work with these board members. And so what you want to say is, hey, look, I have a now Mr. Bonatz out there. He has a family. He actually has a small business owner. He's running for local mayor. He's got no problems. And really this was, he failed because the PTSD was impacting him. So this Sergeant Bernard, see, you've got a theory or the case. So here's where on this hypothetical, where your likely changes for an upgrade. What you wanna show is, hey, here's some fact patterns again no promises uh, that this fact pattern is a guaranteed upgrade. But the reality is you're showing he suffers from PTSD, PTSD, excuse me, and this use was an attempt to cope with those symptoms. Uh, and, you know, there, you're showing the facts and circumstances. And then you're also showing that his in-service performance was exemplary and he has no post-service misconduct. Where you're gonna probably fail and get less likely chance for an upgrade is if you can show that he had a history of misconduct prior to deployment and his PTS diagnosis, if you're showing it as actually this, there's a huge, uh, you know, history of drug abuse, both pre-service, post-service, and then so now I'm not going to say that this one time was an attempt to self-medicate because that's really what we're talking about, but it gets less likely that it's going to persuade board members than it was because it could just be that it's for recreational use. And then again, if you've got a, a post-service history of moral turpitude, and that's really where your post-service uh, history is most, you know, if he's, if he's now a felon, uh, he, he's now drug dealing, that's not going to be as persuasive as if he's, you know, an upright citizen. So the, what I just like to finalize with is what do we see for trends that just help, well, many times you'll have advocates or the applicant, they'll start addressing a laundry list of issues that have nothing to do with their case or just very insignificant. And so really, it's really what a true advocate, it's about managing uh, your fear is, no, you have to take a chance, you have to go with one or two strong case and just that's what you're going for. Trying to throw a laundry list and trying, trying to throw everything against the wall is not as persuasive. Uh, often trying to failing to show that there's a nexus between PTSD and the misconduct and mitigating factors. So for instance, if the misconduct is stealing copper off a building, all the copper rain gutters and going out in town and selling them at the local uh, Army Air Force Supply, that's not gonna be persuaded you're saying that be was because of PTSD. You've got to have a nexus. Now you could do a but for causation there, but again, we'll, that's where you can fail. Finally, the other thing is I would just point out is when you're reviewing these records, especially as an advocate, you would be shocked at what the applicants tell their doctors 
in the medical records. And we will have times where their version of events, whether recalled correctly or not, is substantially different uh, than what's being presented at the hearing or at the document review. So that would probably be a, a practice pointer is, make sure you look at the medical records as exhaustively as possible as you can. So final, uh, next slide. And the final slide is we have an app. Uh, we're trying to modernize. Uh, which I would offer to you and the applicants to uh, review. So with that, again, just uh, I appreciate the opportunity to be here and, and hats off to Mr. Cuthbert for making this possible. Thank you, Rob. That, uh, thank you very much. And obviously, Pro Professor Wandler and the IT team here, I mean, thank you very much, I mean, for helping and enable all of this. And um, I just, so I want to turn it over to the audience for a very quick Q&A because we're starting to run, um, run low on time. I had a bunch of questions for you, but I just want to ask, uh, I'll ask one. And I, what do you, what does the, what do each of your respective boards look for in a personal or telephonic appearance before the board? What are some, what are some uh, points you would want to make about, about practice or what a veteran should know going into um, uh, a, a personal appearance or telephonic appearance? Okay, uh, I'll go first. Uh, we, we do the personal appearances and uh, for the most part, we're, we're looking for a, a full account of, of what, what transpired, what, what led to the misconduct. As, as Mr. Power said, if they can give us the, everything was going great and then suddenly I something happened or I made a poor decision or anything along those lines. And then how did you recover from that? Uh, if, if it's alcohol uh, instances or anything along those lines, was there rehabilitation? Um, what else, uh, what, what have you done to write your life since then? We had a personal appearance and I won't go into the specifics of it, but, but that was something that just, just this week where, where that was something that, uh, uh, that would have helped uh, the case uh, in the discussion of it. Uh, but uh, forthcoming, honest, remorseful, uh, and, uh, and taking responsibility if, if that's the, uh, the contention is, yes, I did it, but it was a poor choice. And yeah, just to piggyback off that. So this personal appearance hearing is extremely important. And what, what are we looking for? Well, you're, there's a couple of factors. One, we're looking for clarification. This is your opportunity. A document review is one thing. This is your opportunity to be heard and express what these documents mean. So oftentimes, because people realize this is their last shot or this is an important shot, they actually gather the documents. So we're going to look at the, now many, there are hearsay, many of the documents, but it's still good. So yeah, we're looking at, you know, what you present. So we're looking at, okay, hey, send in your credit report, send in your character references, send in uh, your boss's, uh, send in your W-2 form, send in, you know, what's your post services. These documents, even though they're just paper, they carry weight with the board members. We're asking you to ex uh, go through your record. And if you're saying you only, if you are saying you had pro and cons of, you know, 5-0, but the record shows 4.3, just citing that is insufficient. Mere statements happen all the time. You've got to, these uh, personal appearance here and your ability to corroborate your evidence. So oftentimes we'll just have the applicant come in and say X and that's it. But if you have a document trying to point to that, that's uh, very important. It is really the human factor. What you're really doing at these telephonic hearings, a little bit harder, uh, but the personal appearance hearings is you're showing worthiness. You're showing rehabilitation. You're showing that in many cases, uh, and this is where you have to make a tough call. You're like, do you admit that you did? Did you admit the, you know, the misconduct or do you say, well, it really wasn't. But if you, one of the arguments is, Hey, look, yes, I smoked, I smoked marijuana. I shouldn't have, I failed. Um, I'm very remorseful. This is how I've made amends over it. And I'm asking for forgiveness. And by the way, if you give me this upgrade, this is going to make a, my, a difference in my life. And for here's why it's going to make a difference in my life. That's what's important. 
you giving us a whole history about why they joined the Marine Corps is not significant. You giving us a history of what you're going to do with this upgrade, that's persuasive. Okay, with that, I'm going to open it up to the, the audience for questions. I have a question right there in, in the back. You'll go there. And then we're going to limit it to two questions. So the first, the question in the back, and then um, you, and then you, you can go next. Yeah. Okay. I was just, uh, you say you had a lot of uh, requests to upgrade the military discharge, which appears to be defaulting to a general discharge. And I wonder if you could explain why a military medical discharge isn't automatically honorable. Oh, no, I'm, I'm sorry if there's a, a, a confusion. A medical will be honorable. Uh, so, but what ends up happening in some of the cases that we see, in particular with our, in the first 180 days, they have an issue that is identified in basic military training uh, that in many cases determined existed prior to service, and they will get an administrative discharge for that if it wasn't service aggravated. Uh, but in some cases, the individual will come in and say, hold up, we, that's not the case at all. And, and they have medical documentation, in which case what they're saying is they want that administrative discharge changed to a medical discharge and they're saying it was an error at the time. And, and it wasn't a general, it was an entry level, uh, which uh, is an uncharacterized discharge was the example that I gave. Okay, do you, do you, have, a, do you have any follow up or are you? case uh, that I reviewed didn't really touch, but he had a general discharge because he had a medical event. And he called it a medical discharge. And I don't, you know, if you, I hear medical discharge quite often, and I wonder, well, what in the heck is that? And why isn't it automatically honorable? Well, uh, so there's a couple of rules there. The first rule is that misconduct trumps disability evaluation systems. Uh, the second rule would be is that I'm going to, you know, what you're presenting, it sounds like, and I'm going to go with this theory, is that they actually went through the disability evaluation system, received a medical discharge, and then generally that's honorable, unless there's a history of misconduct, and so the commander can actually make a characterization on that, and there are cases where you received a, a medical disability retirement or separation, but you got a characterization of uh, general instead of honorable. Is that that may be the case you're seeing? Without looking at the uh, the DD two fourteen, can't really mention more than that. Okay, and we have one last question. Sorry, I'm speaking a little too closely into the mic. Go ahead. Good afternoon, gentlemen. Uh, my name is Laura Buckholtz. Uh, I'm here today in my civilian capacity, but when I have my other hat on, I'm Major Laura Buckholtz, and I'm the Area Defense Counsel for the 120th Airlift Wing here in Montana. Um, sir, I see you've got a command wreath there under your name tag. What is uh, kind of the, the qualifications or the requirements to sit on the board? Are all of you commanders, with the exception of the JAG, of course? So for the Air Force, no, they're not. Uh, and in fact, so for the Air Force Discharge Review Board, we have the five members. You'll have the Discharge Review Board President, which is a former commander myself. Uh, we have a JAG, who is a voting member. We have a doctor, who may be a prior commander, and in some cases is, but uh, sitting on the board. And then we have the two senior NCOs. Uh, and we value their, their perspective uh, because the bulk of our cases are enlisted. And that is just uh, something uh, that's the way the Air Force is determined to, to do it. And then piggyback for the Marine Corps and Navy, for the Naval Discharge Review Board, it's, there's no requirement that you had command, but generally there, uh, we have colonels that sit on the board. You know, you're looking at 06s with 20 plus years of service. Uh, lieutenant colonels, majors, and then we also have incorporated senior enlisted. So right now we have a master sergeant who's sitting with 15 plus years of uh, Marine Corps experience sitting on the board. So generally over those years, you're gonna have command experience, but that's not a requirement. What we look at is you're generally uh, a, a senior officer, uh, mid-grade officer, 
or senior enlisted and also have the appropriate training. We make sure that you're fully trained and qualified before you actually sit as a voting member. That's a good point. We, we do too. We have a training and then we actually have them sit in and observe a couple of uh, boards to where they're, they're familiar with not only the, the, the verbiage that they that are trained on, but also the process and everything. And gentlemen, as a quick follow up, one of my, I guess, tactics that I use for discharge boards when I have my defense hat on is to kind of bring up the flavor of the current military discharge. So for example, 20 years ago, a single drug use without distribution or multiple use would be um, generally a, a special court martial with the BCD. That was almost guaranteed 20 years ago in the Air Force. I, I don't know about the other services. Today, a single use without any other factors is an Article 15 and a kick, generally with a general discharge characterization. Does your experience color that in terms of how a similar situation would have been treated 20 years ago to how a situation is treated now? Yes, we do. And it, it, in fact, in, uh, in, in the slides that, that we submitted, there was, uh, obviously you have retroactive changes that, that directly such as don't ask, don't tell, and we get guidance that says to, to change it. But if you look at the equitable for us, uh, option one, discharge policies or procedures use differ materially from current procedures, and we think it would have been a different outcome. Uh, so, yes, uh, we do. Now, keep in mind, we only have a 15-year window. So, so that change has to, uh, has to have impacted the person in the last 15 years for DRB. DCMR uh, would be more along those lines. But to, to also kind of uh, reinforce what you're saying, we look at what, uh, what typically happens on those types of cases whenever we're here at the DRB. Because if a guy got a UOTHC and every other one – that, that we're aware of is getting a general, then you may be looking at an inequity. It, it's at least a starting point. And then to Mr. Powers' uh, point, that's where we need you to build the cases to, okay, why was that UOTHC wrong? I get that most people got this, but what are the specific circumstances that make that inequitable for this member? And I would concur with that. Just a footnote, um, what generally for the Navy Marine Corps, no, it's not an NJP and a kick with a general. It's NJP kick with another than honorable. That's the vast majority of our cases. So as an advocate, that might be something that you would want to do. Go through the reading room and compare the other services and, and show how, you know, overall, statistically, there appears to be a difference. Now, there is no stare decisis precedent. We're not bad precedent. But again, uh, precedent. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. Okay, and with, and with that, we're gonna close our panel. I just wanna offer you uh, our gratitude for taking the time, your gra gratitude for your service, and, uh, and also gratitude uh, to the sec service secretaries for this level of outreach, which is, I think, incredibly uh, valuable. And I hope, it's, I hope it, the two-way conversation provides value for you as well. Certainly, no, thank you. Thank you, we appreciate it. Thank you.